I'm Jean Purdy. I give quite a few uh, community climate change talks and that's purely because um, I'm very worried about climate change and I want to encourage other people to be worried too and hopefully stir up some action and a few letters to MPs and a little bit of people getting motivated to take some action. So tonight I want to talk to you a little bit about climate change generally, um, what's happening internationally, what international governments are doing, what our government is doing and some impacts that we can expect in New Zealand and finally what um, emissions we're producing and how we personally can have an impact on that. So let's go back to extreme basics. Our planet's warming. How do you warm a planet? Well, there's three ways you can warm a planet. One, you can increase the solar radiation from the sun. And we know that this does fluctuate. It's quite well monitored and it does make some impact on our climate, but not a huge amount. You can move the Earth closer to the sun. And this happens as well in that the orbit of the Earth around the sun and the tilt of the axis of the Earth both impact the warmth on Earth and head us into ice ages and out of ice ages. So we know that this happens. We've been watching that for some time. Or we can stop the radiation escaping once it arrives here. And this is going on as well. So how do you stop the radiation escaping? You have a layer of gases called the atmosphere. This is about 100 kilometres thick around Earth. Uh, and it acts like a glass house, like a greenhouse. So the radiation can get in, but it can't get out again. And the more greenhouse gases you add to that blanket of gases, the more radiation is trapped and the less can escape into space. The atmosphere is good because without it, it would be about minus 20 degrees on Earth. So we, we're happy that it's there. But for the last 200 years or so, humans have been burning fossil fuels at such a rate that we're radically changing the chemical composition of the atmosphere um, and causing the Earth to warm up. So the main greenhouse gases that are causing this warming is water vapour, that's the main one actually, carbon dioxide which comes from the burning of fossil fuels, methane which comes from animals and plants, mainly from their animal digestive systems, and nitrous oxide which comes from land use, factories, um, manure and paddocks and fertilisers. So let's look at the temperatures on earth, what have they been doing? This is a graph that goes back almost a million years, 800,000 years, and the blue line is the temperature. The solid black line there is today's temperature at the zero level. So you can see that sometimes it gets really cold and sometimes it gets really warm. These are glacials and interglacials. You can see also that even in a glacial, we're only five degrees cooler than we are at the moment. You can also see that Homo sapiens evolved around 250,000 years ago. And since then, uh, we've had one period where it's been warmer than current temperatures and humans have lived through two ice ages. Over on the right, you can see where farming evolved. That was only 12,000 years ago. And so in the whole time that modern agriculture has existed, temperature on Earth has only been within half a degree of less or more than it is today. In the last 100 years, we've warmed the planet one degree. So this is a radical new change. If we take that little tiny box there and blow it up, we can see things in a bit more detail than the recent past. So this is the last thousand years of temperatures on Earth. The blue line is CO2 and the red line is temperatures on Earth. So you can see that it seems that we're heading into a new ice age, but over the last thousand years we have cooled 0.2 degrees. So it's a tiny amount and we have to get cooled by about five degrees before we'll be in another ice age. And this is going to take, as I said, 30,000 to 100,000 years. In the meantime, the Industrial Revolution came along and we started spewing um, CO2 and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And then this is what's happened in the last 200 years. So you can see that this rate of change is the thing. The rate of change has never been experienced before on Earth. And that is why this is problematic and that's why we have to start doing something about it. So what are international governments doing about this? Finally, in 2015, the world came to an agreement. So it took that long. And the way they came to the agreement was that they said that everybody can set their own levels. They can set their own limits on how much they are going to reduce emissions. And this is how they got it across the line. But this also means it's quite a weak agreement. The light green countries there have signed the Paris Agreement to reduce emissions. The dark green countries have signed and ratified, which means they're legally bound to do something about it. And the red country, I'm sure you all know, is the United States. The Trump administration has said they want to pull out of the Paris Agreement, but because there's a stand down period, they can't do that until after their next election. So we're um, hoping that that won't happen.
all the countries have agreed, they've said up the top there, we will reduce our greenhouse gas emissions to keep the world below 1.5 degrees of warming above pre-industrial levels. Well, we've already warmed one degree, so it's starting to look less and less likely that we're going to be able to do that. They also said that they would put their best efforts into keeping below 1.5 degrees, but that they would definitely stop us going over two degrees. So if we do want to stay below that magic 1.5 degrees number, this is what we've got to do. We need to get net zero emissions by 2050 globally. Now net zero means that if you plant an awful lot of trees, then you can emit a bit more because they soak up the CO2. Um, but it's a pretty radical path and people are pretty much saying around the world that we've probably missed the boat on this one. If we really, really radically change our lifestyles in the next 10 years, we might be able to get here. So are we doing that? We're doing this. So this is projections. The light blue wedge is the Paris pledges that different governments have given us, and this is where CO2 emissions are going to go if people stick to their Paris pledges, which isn't a given. The dark blue wedge is where emissions are going to go if, um, with current government policies. So people's policies are not even matching their pledges. And either way, it's not looking good. So under Paris Agreement pledges, we would result in a global temperature increase of 2.9 degrees by 2100. And current government policies around the world are projected to result in a 3.2 degrees increase by 2100. So one degree, two degree, three degrees, who cares? You know, won't it just mean that we'll be growing avocados and having sunny holidays? So here's some of the impacts, and the impacts aren't linear, partly because there's a whole lot of feedback loops that happen. Once you start melting big ice caps, you are reflecting a lot less radiation back into space, and so you get a lot of warming. Once you start melting permafrost, you start releasing massive amounts of methane, and that increases the warming. So. It's very hard to track where these things go after the end of the century or after two or three degrees, but best guess is that under a one degree warming, our increase in the number of hot days, so in New Zealand that's about 25 degrees, um, increases by 16% under a one degree warming and 25% under a two degree warming. We currently get about 15 of these hot days a year in Queenstown, and 25 of them in Auckland. So that's quite a big increase. The population facing a severe heat wave every 20 years is half the population under one degree and 70% of the population under two degrees. An ice-free Arctic summer is already happening. Under a one degree warming, that will happen once every 10 years. This was unheard of 100 years ago. Under a two degree warming, eight out of 10 years will have an ice-free Arctic, and that's not so good if you're a polar bear. And under a three degree warming, the, ice, the Arctic will always be ice-free. So that's radical changes for things like polar bears and the Inuit population and whole ecosystems. In New Zealand, the change in frequency of occurrence of extreme heat, under a one degree warming, we get 93% more extreme heat days. So we get three or four of them every summer, we might get six or seven of them under a one degree warming, and about 10 or 20 under a two degree warming. Extreme rain events are gonna increase by 11% under a one degree warming, 22% under a two degree warming, and the average drought length is different in different places, but it's generally somewhere between sort of three and 12 months. Under a one degree warming, that'll increase by two months. Two degrees increase by four months. And under a three degree warming, we're gonna start getting a normal drought being about 18 months. So what have we already seen globally? We're already seeing impacts. This is a, quite a cool graphic put out by a climate scientist called Ed Hawkins, uh, called Climate Stripes. Every stripe is a year from 1900 to 2018. And blue um, lines are cooler than average and red lines are warmer than average. Dark blue is very cold and dark red is very warm. So you can see that we're warming. Sometimes there's a little cool patch, but generally the climate is warming. What's this doing to land-based ice? This is the Uppsala Glacier in Argentina in 1931 on the top picture and 2016 at the bottom picture. Massive amounts of land-based ice are melting all over the world. And land-based ice, the water runs off and goes into the sea and that increases sea level, which I think is going to be one of the biggest impacts globally of climate change. Sea ice is also disappearing. This doesn't increase sea levels because it's already floating in the sea. Um, this is the North Pole, and that's what I was saying about um, ice-free Arctics. The top picture is 1984, and the bottom picture is 2012. So you can see the, the famed Northwest Passage is almost permanently open now and polar bears are said to be extinct in 40 years' time. 
All this water is pouring into the sea. There's two ways that you increase sea level. One is you pour a lot of water in there, but the other is you warm it up because um, that results in thermal expansion. This is St Mark's Square in Venice, um, regularly getting flooded with seawater now. They're just spending $7 billion on a seawater flood protection scheme. Tuvalu is only two metres above sea level and they are really vocal at UN climate meetings because they don't have anywhere to go. They can't move to higher ground. The sea level has already risen 20 centimetres in the last century and it's projected to rise 40 to 100 centimetres by the end of the century, depending on what we do with emissions. 2% of the world's population live within one metre of current sea level. That is 150 million people looking for a new home. A lot of them getting in boats and coming here. So I think this is going to be the biggest impact that our children, and possibly some of us, are going to feel. And if emissions remain high, that number could be much higher because of these feedback loops that I talk about. You know, if the Greenland ice sheet collapses, they sort of reach tipping points, and then a whole lot of ice starts to really melt. Uh, and then we could see, I mean, there's been some projections of up to eight metres of sea level rise. So let's look at New Zealand, what's been happening here. This is New Zealand average temperature over the last 100 years. This is an average of seven key climate stations, um, showing a clear warming, obviously some cold years and some warm years, but a clear warming over that period. We've also got ice melting. This is the Tasman Glacier in um, 2009 in the top photo and 2016 in the bottom photo. That red dotted area, although it doesn't look like ice, is um, covered in gravel, but it's, it's ice. And that's a couple of kilometres of ice that's disappeared in seven years there. Franz Josef Glacier, we all know, is also melting. That's 1997 in the top photo and 2018 in the bottom photo. And sea level rise is already impacting a lot of places around New Zealand. So Haumoana in the Hawke's Bay is a settlement that's all getting washed away. Um, Granity on the west coast is getting washed away. But one of the biggest impacts currently is South Dunedin. The, the tide is coming in, and especially in spring tides or high tides, is coming right through the sandbanks and flooding the whole suburb of South Dunedin. There's thousands of houses there, and it's quite a problem. They spend a lot of money pumping water. The local government and central government are both talking about whose problem it is, and they're talking about having to move the whole suburb of people, thousands of people out. But who pays for that? Nobody's got the answer. They're talking about digging canals to soak up the, key, the seawater. These are the questions that are going to have to be answered by local and central government about who pays to move communities. And there's a lot of research being done on insurance and whether any of these properties will be able to be insured in the future. What are we going to see in the future? Um, warming, obviously. This is a low emissions scenario on the left by the end of the century and a high emissions scenario on the right by the end of the century. We can see about one degree warming um, by the end of the century under low emissions and a, about a four degree warming under high emissions. Um, and mainly in the central areas because the sea moderates the temperature around the coast. It's going to rain more generally in the west and south of New Zealand and less in the east and north. Under a low emissions scenario on the left we expect to be about 5% wetter on the west coast and in Fiordland and about 5% drier on, up on East Cape. But under a high emissions scenario up to 20% wetter down the west coast and in Fiordland and up to 10% drier in the East Cape. Heavy rainfall is going to increase, this is a given. If you take a parcel of air and you warm it by one degree, it can carry 8% more moisture. So therefore when it does rain, we're going to get bigger rain events and more flooding. So that's thermal change in heavy rainfall, but also because we're getting stronger westerly winds over New Zealand, especially down the west coast. We know that the west coast rainfall comes from westerly winds which get pushed up by the mountains and dump their rain. Um, so we're going to get more rain that way as well. About one extra tropical cyclone is going to hit the North Island uh, every year, um, but the, the air bounds around that are very uncertain. They've been, what they've been seeing uh, in other places around Central America is that cyclones are not becoming any more frequent, but they're getting much, much stronger. And that makes sense with a whole load more energy in the system to feed into them. This graph is from uh, NIWA via MFE and it shows the strong winds, the 99th percentile wind and a high emission scenario by the end of the century being up to 10% stronger through the middle of the South Island. Sea level rise, this is an inundation map. So on the left we've got now and on the right we've got the end of the century with a sort of mid to high emission scenario. Snow, we can expect quite big changes to snow obviously as it gets warmer. Picture on the left is Mount Footstool and Mount Cook National Park in summer, same time of year, summer 1950 up the top and 2018 at the bottom. Quite radical differences in snowpack. 
NIWA did a study a few years ago uh, where they said that by the 2040s we can expect about a 10% decrease in snow depth and by the 2090s up to a 50% decrease in snow depth. They did a study for the New Zealand Ski Field Association and said that as long as they have snow making they'll survive for a few decades yet, but after that they're going to need to move uphill. The irony is that uphill, because we're getting increased precipitation, once you get above that freezing level, which is rising all the time, there's going to be more snow at elevation. And I've been modelling this for the electricity industry to, to figure out whether in the future we're going to have um, more snow or less snow in our catchments, which is part of the water that we get for electricity generation. Drought is going to be um, stay the same on the west coast, no change to drought because there's very little drought there already. Um, but on the east coast we can expect quite a big increase in drought, about a 10% increase in number of days in drought by 2040 and um, quite a lot more than that by 2080. And um, dry days is the map on the right, that is days with less than a millimetre of rain. We can expect under a high emission scenario up to 30 more dry days a year in some parts of New Zealand. So emissions, what are our emissions? This is a picture of New Zealand's greenhouse gas emissions. It's quite a, a busy picture, but I'll point out some features to you. This picture is very different from most countries around the world. Most countries, energy and transport are the big emitters, but for us it's agriculture. Half of our emissions are from agriculture, of which 22.5% of the total is dairy cattle. And some of, most of that's from methane, from digestion, uh, from cows and sheep, or cows. Some of it's nitrous oxide, which is fertiliser and manure mostly. Um, electricity generation is very low in New Zealand, 4.4% and dropping. That's because we're largely renewable and increasing that renewable share. And the government has decided that we should be focusing on some low-hanging fruit. And those are industrial processes and transport. And the government is going to push policies which um, help us electrify industrial processes and transport over the next decade. And we're going to have to build a lot of wind farms, we're going to have to build some grid solar, but our electricity system can handle it, and it can handle it largely because we've got the big historical hydro, which are like the battery bank. If you've got a big hydro scheme, you can hold onto the water while the wind's blowing and then let it go when the wind stops. So they work very well together, and that's where the government's heading. So I think it's good in emissions to remember that there's some really tough ones. I think agriculture is going to be quite hard and everyone acknowledges that. New Zealand government's doing quite a lot. This current government, they've put, brought in a Zero Carbon Act by 2050. They've got an emissions trading scheme where big emitters pay money and people who plant trees receive money on a, on a basic level. Agriculture has so far been exempt from that because it's going to be, it could cost money to fix the emissions problem there. This government was going to bring agriculture into the emissions trading scheme by 2025 and just last week the farmers and government have come up with a plan together to reduce emissions. So the government's watching, they're going to see what the farmers come up with, they're going to check in on 2022 to see how they're going um, with the threat that they may still be brought into the emissions trading scheme by 2025 if they're not heading on that downward path. There's a lot of research to look at a type of seaweed which if you feed it as a supplement to cows it reduces their emissions, methane emissions by 80%. So it's those sort of technological innovations that we need to help tackle this problem. The government's also wants, they've said they want 100% renewable electricity by 2035 but um, the Interim Climate Change Commission said they should aim for sort of 98% because that last 2% will be extremely expensive for everyone. So that's the way it's looking. There's no new offshore oil and gas exploration. They're planting a billion trees by 2028 and they're planning to phase out coal and electricity generation by 2030. Our modelling says that will happen earlier because our plant, coal plant is old and wind is cheaper. So that it will be replaced with wind. This is a really good way of looking at emissions. This group of people has got together and said, so if we go by on a per capita basis, let's make sure that everyone does their fair share toward our goals. So our fair share will be a lot lower than China, who have a lot more people and a lot more emissions. So this graph shows us, this is for New Zealand. Uh, zero emissions is that black line in the middle. The squiggly black line is what our emissions have been over the last 20 years. You can see that they're levelling out. The blue bar is where our current policy projection is, is forecast to take us. If we want to stay below 1.5 degree compatible, our fair share of that would mean that we need to follow that green trajectory down. If we're happy to go to two degrees globally, then our fair share of that is following the yellow bars down, and the orange is, is not good enough. And our black, the black box is our Paris pledge, which is that we will 
reduce emissions to 30% below 2005 levels by 2030. So our emissions are projected to drop, but not enough to meet our Paris pledge. I'll draw your attention to the y-axis there. We emit about 80 megatons of CO2 equivalent, so that's taking the other greenhouse gases, but measuring them all so we can compare apples with apples, we're talking about CO2 equivalent here. We produce 80 megatons of CO2 equivalent a year. China produces 13,000 megatons of CO2 a year. So 80 for us, 13,000 for them. They have been heading up steeply, but they are changing. They're the biggest producer of solar panels in the world. Uh, they have the government structure to make big sweeping changes. They have massive air pollution problems, which is partly why they're dealing with things like transport. In Beijing, if you want to register an electric car, it's free and instant. If you want to re um, register a petrol car, you go into a lottery with 100 other people. One of you is allowed to register your car, and it costs the same as buying a small car. So for air pollution reasons, China is making big changes. But they are also very committed to the Paris Agreement as well, and they're making big changes all around. However, their Paris pledge sees them still heading upwards, and their policy projection is the same. So more needs to be done. The EU has been tracking down for a while. This is for a few different reasons, and some closure of some coal plant, but largely efficiency standards, efficiency in transport, efficiency in manufacturing, and efficiency in household items. That's largely why they've been tracking down, but they have, do have reasonably good progressive policies. That pink wedge is their policy projections out into the future. So they're looking at getting to sort of zero by 2050, if they keep going and if they do a bit better. The USA has actually been tracking down for the same reasons, closure of some old coal plant and efficiency. President Obama came up with the Green New Deal and committed the US to that pink line downwards, which was looking awesome, um, but the Trump administration is unwinding that as fast as they can go. So their Paris commitment is the black box, which is insufficient uh, relative to their fair share, but even that's, they may pull out of that anyway. And Japan has been sort of flatlining for quite a while and their policy projection gets them heading down but not fast enough. It's not looking like we're doing enough and we're not. But can we change? Do we have a historical reference for how fast we can change? Well, of course, you only have to look at World War II and how the whole world mobilised then. But everybody was pretty scared at that point. I don't think we're scared enough yet. But there's other references we can compare to. The top left picture is the New York Easter Parade in 1900, and the bottom right picture is the New York Easter Parade in 1913. The top left picture is 99% horse and cart, and the bottom right picture is 99% car. So in 13 years, we went from all horse and carts to all cars, and it must have been pretty scary in the meantime, I must say. So we, do, we can change fast when we want to. The ozone hole, in 1987 the Montreal Protocol was signed to that people would stop producing CFCs to try and get, deal with the ozone hole. 98% of ozone depleting substances have now gone and the hole will close fully by 2050. Almost 2 million cases of cancer are avoided each year because of that action. The world has precedent for this, we have changed fast in the past. We've moved from incandescent bulbs to LEDs in less than 10 years, pretty much the whole globe. So change is possible if we want it enough. What's helping us is that some things are happening naturally. The price of renewable electricity is dropping like a stone and is being taken up everywhere. As old coal plant retires, why would you build a coal plant which in New Zealand might cost you $100 a megawatt to produce your power when a wind farm can be built for $60 a megawatt? So this is the globally uh, utility scale, that's grid solar, um, deployment and cost. So the yellow bars are how much grid solar is being built globally, and the red line is how much it's, got, it's costing over the last 10 years. So it's changing radically, and we see in our modelling grid solar starting to be picked up by about 2030, in the North Island of course, not so much down here. Electric vehicles, the blue line's the uptake of electric vehicles globally, and I drove here in an electric vehicle today and I love it. A friend of mine in Twizel has got an electric vehicle and he used to spend $60 a week on petrol and he now spends $2 a week on charging his electric vehicle. And onshore wind deployment and cost. Onshore wind has come down radically, the cost of it is a lot cheaper and there's a lot of it being built. Offshore wind is being built as well, but um, the oceans around us are too deep and too rough to make offshore wind um, effective at the moment. Before I talk about what we can do as individuals, I do have to say that many, many people say that the strongest thing you can do 
uh, is to write to your government, write to your MP, write to your ministers and urge them to do more. But there are some other things we can do. 33% of the food we grow is thrown out and that's 8% of global emissions. Plant trees. Trees are great carbon sinks. I've calculated how many trees I need to plant to soak up my family's carbon emissions. Most of my air travel is done through work, so mainly, but we do drive long distances, my family and I. Uh, and I have to plant 20 trees a year to soak up our carbon. Um, Aviation is responsible for 2% of global carbon emissions, and air travel guilt is a thing that's starting to be uh, talked about a lot. Concrete. Cement is 8% of global emissions. Perhaps we need to look at different ways of building our houses. By local, transport emissions for transporting food is, is huge. We're so used to having so much choice, but buying local supports our local economy and lowers transport emissions. Drive an electric car, even if it's powered by coal-fired electricity. Victoria University has been doing some research to finally look at what the emissions are from the manufacture, use and recycling of an electric car compared to a petrol car. And if you drive in New Zealand with our high renewable proportion of electricity, if you drive an electric car, you'll produce 62% less emissions than if you drive a petrol car. But Australia has an 85% coal electricity generation system. And if you drive an electric car in Australia, you still produce 28% less emissions. And part of that is that an electric car takes 90% of the energy out of the fuel. It's 90% efficient and a petrol car is sort of 15 to 20% efficient. So driving an electric car is good no matter where you live. So just to finish up, here's a great quote from Michael Mann, who's a um, very well-known climate scientist in the States. He said, the single biggest way to have an impact on climate change and other environmental crises is through collective pressure on policymakers to act in our interest rather than special interests. New Zealand ostensibly doesn't subsidise fossil fuels, although I think Greenpeace might argue against that. But if every country in the world that subsidises fossil fuels stopped subsidising them, we would lower emissions by up to 10% overnight. So there's a lot of stuff that we need to do. We need to recycle our plastic bags, we need to fly less. But if things like that are happening, then those are the things that should change first and quickly. So writing to your government can help them apply pressure to change those sorts of actions. And just finally, a great quote from John Holden, who was the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy under President Obama. He says, we have three options. Mitigation, lower our emissions. Adaptation, move all our houses back from the ocean. And suffering, we are going to do some of each. The more mitigation we do, the less adaptation will be required and the less suffering there will be. There is no planet B.